Okay. <laughs> so Jane said I did get my original training as a researcher to develop drugs. I did that at Michigan State University in the College of Human Medicine. And so uh, not very often do you start your contemplative uh, talk out with drugs, but we're going to do that today. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a question. What if I told you there was a drug that lowered your anxiety, lowered your depression, made you more resilient in the face of change or suffering, improved your interpersonal relationships, made you more productive, and also made you more innovative and creative, in addition to helping you care for people, would you take that drug? <laughs> I would, <laughs> but like you know, all drugs have side effects, uh, and all of those things that I told you about actually can be found if you can raise your levels of self-compassion. And so, uh, all of these things, you can have these outcomes, and you don't have to take a drug, you just have to learn to change your relationship with yourself so that it's compassionate. Uh, and so, you know, what is self-compassion? Self-compassion is basically the relationship that you have with yourself. So everybody kind of has that little voice in their head that has the conversation that's going on. Uh, and sometimes that, that voice in your head can be really critical. So if you, if you do something, you, you know, maybe you tripped on stage and your little voice goes, oh, you're such an idiot. <laughs> or you know, maybe you mess something up at work and your little voice is like, oh, you're never going to get this right. You're going to get fired. That's kind of a harsh and critical internal voice and a harsh and critical relationship with yourself. So somebody who has a high level of self-compassion, when they trip on the stage, they will be more likely to notice that they're suffering and actually say something to themselves that's kind and compassionate, like, ooh, bummer. <laughs> Hang in there, you got it. Pick yourself up, you know, something along those lines. And so compassion is, is holistically how you treat yourself. And so you don't have to take my word for it. There's 10 years of research out there, study after study after study, that shows that if you can raise your level of self-compassion, you can have all of these positive outcomes, that you know, both psychological and real health outcomes as well. And so uh, everybody has a handout. This is the first uh, part of the handout, um, because compassion or self-compassion or inner compassion essentially has three components. Uh, and those components are pretty, pretty important to, uh, to remember because we're going to use a tool at the end that includes each of these components. So the first component is mindfulness. I'm sure you've probably heard of mindfulness by now. It was on the front cover of Time magazine. It's been in Forbes magazine. Uh, it's kind of hitting popular culture. So. Uh, Mindfulness has a pretty simple definition. It's being present and aware in the present moment. And the trick about that is it's without judgment. Right? Does that make sense? So if you're being mindful, you're aware of what's happening like around you. You're right here. You're not planning your next vacation in your mind. You're not thinking about something silly that you did at work. You're right here, right here with us, right? That's present moment awareness. And then the non-judgmental part is really important as well. So you can be right here and you can be judging yourself for how you are. You could be judging yourself for how you look, you could be judging yourself for what you say. But mindfulness tells you, you know, just to stop, notice, be present with what's going on. And so the simplest definition is to be uh, in the present, or to, to be aware in the present moment without judgment. Uh, and in fact, that definition was coined by somebody named John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, he started a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, which is a great mindfulness program that, that has been proven to lower your stress levels. Um, and he essentially took 
Buddhist principles and created that program, and so he's widely known for bringing mindfulness to the West. Okay, and when I teach this stuff, when I teach people mindfulness, they, they pretty much get it. You know, they understand that they can pause and be right here in the moment. They also understand the common humanity part. So common humanity means that you recognize that you're part of a greater whole. Uh, and so the opposite of common humanity would be thinking that, oh, the problems that I have, nobody else has. You know, oh, my life is harder than anybody else's. Or trying to kind of isolate yourself, right? Those types of things um, are the opposite of common humanity. Common humanity is just the recognition that I'm human, I'm part of a whole group of humans here on Earth, and we all suffer, we all have problems, and it's okay. All right. And so usually when you tell people that, they're like, okay, I got it. Let's get to go, self-compassion. And then you get to self-kindness, and I say, okay. Now the final part is that you want to be kind to yourself. And it's like, flat line, like nobody knows how to do it. It's like they've completely forgotten how to be kind to themselves. So we're going to do just a little exercise. Because what I found is that people naturally are able to be compassionate towards others. And, and I think this is probably a group that's in the, <laughs> what, probably 90th percentile of being able to be compassionate to others. So you're going to excel at this exercise. So what we're going to do is we're just going to write down a few things on your handout. Um, I did not bring extra pens, so if you could borrow a pen. Uh, and, then, and then what we're going to do is we're going to turn to our neighbor in, in pairs or threes, and we're going to have a little discussion. All right? Everybody on board? OK. So this first part you just do by yourself. And you can write it down. Or if you don't have a pen, you can just think about it in your head. OK, here we go. I want you to think about various times when you've had a close friend who was suffering in some way, had a misfortune, they failed, they felt inadequate, perhaps they were dying. How do you typically respond to your friend or to someone close to you in that situation? What do you say to them? And even what kind of tone of voice do you use? So just jot down some notes. Like, Think about a, a real situation that you have, maybe something that's going on right now with a friend, or it could be just in the immediate past. How would you treat that person that was suffering that you really care for? OK, does everybody have a, a situation in mind of somebody and how they would treat them if they're suffering? Got it? What kind of tone of voice you'd use? OK, excellent. Now, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to imagine a time in the recent past that you were suffering. Maybe don't pick something that was like on a scale of 1 to 10 at a 10. You know, maybe pick something around a 4, 3. Uh, and just cons consider for yourself. I'm, I'm going to ask you the same questions. Just think in your mind, how do I treat myself when I'm suffering? What tone of voice do I use with myself? OK, you can open your eyes and just jot down a few notes about how you treat yourself when you're suffering.
Okay. And as you're finishing up, uh, let's break up into twos or threes. And what I'd like you to do um, is to share with your partner, you know, what you're willing to share. This is a, a, a safe space, and when, uh, we want to respect each other. Um, remember that we're not here to fix each other, we're here to compassionately listen. So um, why don't you share a little bit with your partner about what you do when you see someone else suffering versus what you do with yourself. We'll just take about five minutes. So, um, would anybody use their compassionate courage and be willing to share um, something that they notice, the difference between how they are, treat others who are suffering versus themselves? Doesn't have to be anything profound. I can talk. Sure. When I treat others, I am very kind and very... Um, I try to listen to them, try to understand what they are going through, and try to pamper them. Mm -hmm. No, that's like the first thing I do is try to pamper them, to get physical contact, like a hug or a kiss or something. And when it's me, the one that is suffering, I just swallow everything and try to be the hard one and show to everybody that I'm okay, even though in my inside I'm breaking down. Mm. You know, it's like completely different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's almost the exact opposite, right? Yes, yes. When a one you're really opening up with compassion and the other you're kind of shutting, yes. shutting down. I, I gotta handle this by myself. <laughs> I better get it figured out before anyone notices. <laughs> Does anybody else wanna share? It's, uh, that's typically the trend. Uh, a survey that Dr. Neff did, um, I think it was om almost 1,000 people, uh, well over 80% treated others much more kindly than themselves. And so you're not at all out of the norm, if that's what it is for you. Uh, and it's very, it's part of our culture, right? Um, we're taught to kind of, you know, have a stiff upper lip and, uh, just suck it up and, uh, no, you know, don't let anybody see you cry type of a thing. And so it's really part of our culture um, to have these, like, negative and critical voices in our heads for ourselves. But if, you know, if we turn that around and we did that to somebody who was suffering, they wouldn't be our friend anymore, right? <laughs> They'd be like, wow, she's mean. <laughs> I don't want to be her friend. But yet we kind of think that if nobody can look inside our head and nobody can see what's going on, that we can somehow get away with it. And it doesn't have any of bad effects, right? It's not true, though, right? We know that if you can be more compassionate to yourself, then you get that list of goodies that I showed on that first slide, right? Less anxiety and depression, more innovation and creativity, better interpersonal relationships. So uh, we want to be self-compassionate, right? Right? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> A lot of the times when I talk about being compassionate to yourself, this is kind of the face that people make. Kind of like, oh, Cynthia, that might be good for you. <laughs> but I'm a giving person, and I'm compassionate to others. I, I can't do that for myself, you know, no way. Uh, and they have all kinds of different stories that they tell me about why they can't do it for themselves. And... Uh, they actually tend to be uh, pretty universal, so universal that it's in the curriculum that I teach for mindful self-compassion. Uh, one thing that people say is, I can't do that because it's just self-pity. I don't want to have a pity party, you know, I don't want it to be all about me and blah, blah, blah. You know, I have such a terrible life, I'm suffering. But uh, uh, in fact, <coughs> 
Self-compassion is more highly correlated with the ability to take others' perspectives. And so if you think about pity, pity is a very self-centered type of a thing where you really turn on yourself, oh, my suffering is the worst. Uh, but if you know how to practice self-compassion, you're better able to take on other people's perspectives. And then that's that common humanity piece. You're, you're better able to recognize that it's not just you that's suffering. And you can get yourself out of um, some unnecessary suffering. Ah, the inner bully. <laughs> it says, and the, this is very male response. Right? Oh, yeah, I can't do that. I'm going to be perceived as being weak. All right, cowboy. Uh, the good news is this all happens inside of your head, so nobody does have to see if you're treating yourself kindly or if you're treating yourself like this guy. <laughs> and in fact, uh, self-compassion is highly correlated with resilience. Resilience is the most powerful uh, characteristic that you can have. Resilience is that thing that when you when the world kicks you and you're down, resilience, people with high resilience can pick themselves back up and they can keep going. Uh, and it's, uh, resilience is one of the best characteristics to have when you're suffering. So it's not weak. And some people say, oh, I cannot possibly be nice to myself or I'm going to eat the whole cake. <laughs> That it's just self-indulgent, you know, like, I don't want to be one of those people who's always doting on themselves and, you know, I don't want to be self-indulgent. I can't, I can't do that. This, is, this stuff is for somebody else. Well, the good news is that self-compassion is highly correlated with being able to make healthy behavior changes, and not only to make them, but to sustain them. So, uh, I guess you can kind of think about this, if we think about it like as an example, like a mother being compassionate to a child. Uh, if I had a child, I don't, but let's pretend. If I had a kid and they said, mom, I want a cookie. You know, a compassionate mom, I might be like, okay kid, there's a cookie. You know, but if my child came to me and said, mom, I want 20 cookies. You know, if I just took the box of 20 cookies and went, here kid, 20 cookies. You know, everybody just immediately knows that's not a compassionate response, right? It's the same with ourselves, right? We have that inner guidance. If we can do it for our child, if we know how to treat our child compassionately around health behaviors, we know how to do it for ourselves. It's in there. You can tap into it. And it's part, and if you think about it as being kind to yourself, then you can, you can tap into it and you can make some serious awesome life changes. Um, just as an aside, my personal story is that uh, I was an alcoholic. And when I ran across the, I actually ran across the science literature of self-compassion, and I started reading all kinds of articles. And I, I, uh, I was really excited because I was like, this stuff really works. And then I had to, when I, when I realized like what it was, this, that you had to have a kind relationship with yourself, like the blood dropped out of my head <laughs> because I realized I didn't have any of it. Uh, and uh, uh, when I realized what it was, I asked myself, well, what would be the most self-compassionate thing that I could do for myself? And I couldn't even finish the thought, and the answer was there. I needed to quit drinking, and I did. And I used uh, self-compassion as a way to get through that process. And it's changed my life in amazing ways. And so this whole changing your health habits is serious stuff. It works. Ah, some people say, oh, and it's just going to undermine my motivation, that I'm not going to be able to get off the couch if I'm nice to myself. You know, I have to self-flagellate, get off the couch, get off the couch. <laughs> That's the only way I can motivate myself. Well, the research also proves you wrong. We know that people who are higher in self-compassion have higher levels of productivity. And uh, Kristen works at UT in Austin, and she has studied several groups of undergraduate students that are coming through there. And the undergraduate students that rank higher in self-compassion are more productive, get better grades, and they just do better in school in general. And so this stuff really works. 
And it's not going, you're not going to become lazy if you actually treat yourself kindly. And some people say, I can't do it because it's narcissistic. You know, I'm the kind one. I'm not like the self-centered one. Um, but that's absolutely not true because we know that people that have high self-compassion have better interpersonal relationships. And you can understand why this is, right? Because if you have like the baseline of how you treat yourself, it's, it's amazing in how your relationships will change. And so for me in particular, one thing that I notice is that um, if I'm really beating myself up about something, you know, say I have a deadline at work and I'm stressed out about the deadline and I'm like, ah, giving myself a hard time about it. If I have a person that I'm working with and they like, like blow a deadline or something, I'm like, ah! <laughs> but if I actually can be more self-compassionate with myself, with the problems and the suffering that I'm experiencing, then I can extend mercy. Like, I'm a mercy machine when it comes to uh, like giving people a bit of leeway when they're suffering. But it's because I can do it for myself first. And so it's really important. And so your interpersonal relationship will, will totally um, begin to improve. Okay. Now we're going to switch gears to a tiger. <laughs> so um, I just got done yesterday giving a talk to a group of entrepreneurs downtown. And the whole thing was called the fear of getting started. And we talked about the fear of how it's hard sometimes to get your business started, it's hard to get your project going, it's hard to start your taxes. Getting things started, especially new things or scary things, can be uh, really challenging. And one of the things I did for them is I said, don't worry, it's normal. That's actually how us humans are wired. And so if you think about the humans that are here now, we're the ones that outran the tiger, right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's not actually true, right? Because everybody knows we can't outrun a tiger. We outsmarted the tiger. So we're the humans that were able to be vigilant, and we looked around and said, is that going to kill me? Uh, no, okay. Is that going to kill me? No, all right. Ooh, that's new. Is that going to kill me? So what we have evolved to do is to be vigilant and always be looking for things that might cause us harm, right? Which helped us to evolve. We're here. But the problem is, a lot of times this system gets turned on unnecessarily, like through chronic anxiety, through worrying, um, and self-criticism. That little voice in your head that's like, oh, you're going to screw this up. I can't believe you just said that. You know, that self-critical voice, that actually has physiological implications for us. And so, just like our ancestors, when they were presented with something that was scary and they were in a place that they had to, uh, uh, basically, uh, the fight or flight response. Has anybody heard of that? It's, yeah, it's pretty, mostly, most people know about it. It means that when you're presented with a danger, your body gears up to basically either fight or to run away. And so what happens physiologically is that your blood goes into your big muscles, like your your legs and your arms, and you're ready, to, you're ready to go. And so like, if you wanted to do like, something like fine dexterity, like, you'd be out of luck if you're trying to thread a needle at that point. Right? Uh, you also would be out of luck if you're trying to do any like, higher order thinking, because the blood leaves your frontal lobe <laughs> to go to your muscles. And so when we put ourselves into a heightened state of anxiety by criticizing ourselves, we're actually impairing ourselves of making good judgments. And so it's important to kind of uh, be able to practice that mindfulness to recognize when you're criticizing yourself, acknowledging that that's suffering when you're criticizing yourself, uh, and then you can take some action to be kind to yourself about it. OK. So um, what are some ways to practice self-kindness? Um, just shout them out. What? what was that? Meditation. Meditation. Take a nap. Take a nap. Rest is wonderful. Absolutely. Get a massage. I love that one. Humor. Humor. Ooh, wonderful for the spirit. Yeah. Praying. 
Another great way to take care of yourself. Anybody else? What's that? Ooh, listen to yourself. I love, keep track of that self-talk. Yeah, what's going on? Exercising. What, ex moving your body. Absolutely. That's a really great way to take care of yourself. Very good. You guys are good at this. All right. So roughly, you know, they break down kind of along the, the mind, body, spirit, right? Um, for your body, you could take care of your body, get rest, get exercise, eat nourishing food all of that stuff. Um, there's also something that we're going to talk about in a bit called soothing touch, which is a way to change your physiology uh, through interacting with your body. Uh, and in your mind, uh, like you said, uh, Jane, that keeping track of what's going on, the, the talk in your head, and using compassionate self-talk, that's really important. And we're going to end with a little mantra, give you a little tool to take with you tonight on that. Um, and then also taking care of your spirit with prayer and meditation. So, uh, good job. All right. So, soothing touch. Uh, okay, I want everybody to take two hands and put them on their chest. Okay, close your eyes. We don't want to look silly in front of other people. <laughs> and now take a deep breath and let it out. Mm, can you feel warmth, compassion? And you can gently open your eyes. And you don't have to take your hands down if that feels good up there. <laughs> That is one example of something that's called soothing touch. And so there are a variety of ways for us to be able to actually interact with our own bodies to change our physiology. So we were just talking about how we can uh, really get our, our nervous system fired up with fight or flight response with, with self-criticism. So soothing touch is a way to go the other direction. It's a way to calm it down. Soothing touch can lower your heart rate. And it also can release something called oxytocin. And so uh, that's a hormone that's often released when mothers are breastfeeding. Uh, that's kind of when it's the biggest release. But it's, it's in males and females. And it's sometimes called the love hormone or the bonding hormone. And so... Um, I'm sure you've experienced at some time when somebody that you really love gives you a hug, you know, and they kind of hold on just a little too long to where, like, you finally can just, like, relax your shoulders and you just kind of go, ah. That is the oxytocin feeling. Or the feeling that you might have been able to generate with your hands on your, on your chest. That kind of warmth, that soothing feeling. That is what the release of oxytocin feels like. And so we can do this with touch. And so another uh, type of soothing touch, and everybody can give this a shot, is it's stroking like this. And so when you stroke your arm, come on, everybody, try it. We're not shy here. When you stroke your arm like this, it's Everybody kind of knows how to do this compassionate touch. You know, you've all done it with a dog or a child or a loved one, right? We do this automatically. We are wired to do this touch. And so when I say give yourself a compassionate touch, you don't go, <laughs> you know, you know exactly how hard it should be. You know exactly how long you should do it and at what rate. And it turns out that we have something in our skin cells called C fibers and they only pick up this type of touch. And it goes right to the emotional parts of our brain. And so what it's doing is actually registering. It's a, it's a, it's a sensory organ that is only for compassion. <laughs> and so that's pretty cool. And so you, know, you can do this compassionate touch with yourself if you're feeling really anxious somewhere. If you're at work and at your desk and you don't want anybody to see, you can kind of just do it along your legs. That works. Uh, and so um, that 
There's another one that I really like, uh, and it's called the Face Cradle. I'm going to put the mic down a second so I can show you. Just like this. Everybody do it. Don't make me look like this. Oh, he's already doing it. Oh, it feels good to me. I actually used to do this at work when I got overburdened before I even know what I knew what I was doing. And so you can do it with one hand, you can do it with two. It, really, this is very personal. Some people are going to feel these as compassionate, and some of them, maybe all of them, are going to feel awkward. Um, I really like this one, too. This really reminds me of like when I was sick when I was a little kid, and my mom put her hand on my forehead. And, oh, it made me feel better, like, oh, good, somebody's taking care of me. And so you can just kind of play around with some of these different soothing um, touches, but they're, they're very powerful. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you remember the Saturday Night Live sketch with Stuart Smalley. This is always who I think of when I do compassionate touch exercises with people because this is how people feel. This, this was an early um, mocking of the positive thought and positive affirmation movement. And he and Stuart would always say to him, he, was looking, he would look endearingly in the mirror at himself, and he would say, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and darn it, people like me. And he could not get any cheesier. And, and that's, it's funny because that's one of the things about doing some of these self-compassion exercises. They're all cheesy. <laughs> but my encouragement to you is be courageous and cut through the cheese and do them anyway because they have such positive benefits. And you know, most of them you can get away with doing just in your head. You can, if you're really stressed out at work or someplace, you can always go to the bathroom and put your hands over your heart. You guys can do this. And, and don't worry about feeling silly because we've got 10 years of research that says that you're gonna be more awesome if you do this stuff. <laughs> Um, another way that you can help yourself is by practicing speaking to yourself in a more compassionate voice. I think it's really easy for us to default back to that inner critic voice. Uh, you know, if you do something stupid, it says, you're dumb. If you do something really awesome, it says, who do you think you are? You know, you can't win with it, right? It, it's always there, yappity, yappity. Uh, and so one of the things you can do is actually, like, practice some of these compassionate phrases. You can make some compassionate phrases of your own. And the idea with these is that when that little critical voice comes up, if you have a compassionate phrase, and, and literally I will write these down, uh, like cut a three by five card in half, write these down and stick them in my wallet and carry them around with me. And I trade them out, whichever I'm feeling like I need to learn. Um, but it's really great to have that as a, as a reminder. You can write a compassionate phrase for yourself, put it on a postie, stick it in your bathroom mirror, stick it in the dashboard of your car. Just a way to remind yourself that like, it doesn't, you don't have to live in the world of the inner critic all the time. And when you live in the world of the inner critic, you're suffering. And you don't have to suffer. And even if you are suffering, you deserve some compassion. And so you deserve a kind phrase. And so, uh, the one on the bottom is, is my favorite, and I have like this grandmother character in my mind. She's not actually my grandma. She's like everybody's best grandma. And she says to me, oh honey, I love you just the way you are. And I go, ah, oh, thank you, fictitious grandma. <laughs> and so you can play around with different phrases for yourself. The good thing about, and, and if you're going to be going to the course that's coming up, you can see that first part of your handout is a schedule. We're going to be, uh, the second, uh, or the third course is going to be all about finding your compassionate voice, and so we're going to do some real good work on this. Find your own phrases, uh, create your own inner allies. It's going to be really fun. So, the tool that I want to end on tonight is a very simple mantra. You can choose to memorize it the way that it is. You can choose to write it on a, the back of a business card and stick it in your wallet. You can also choose to modify it. But it has three important components. This is suffering. Everyone suffers. 
May I be kind to myself. Does anybody notice what these three components are? You got it. Common humanity, yes. So the first one, this is suffering. That's practicing the mindfulness. You know, that's stopping when your head and, and your voice is going blah, 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 blah. You stop and go, ah, ah. Cynthia told me to stop and recognize that inner critic as suffering. Recognize it for the suffering that it is. Ah. And you know, I don't judge myself for it. I, go, I don't go, oh, there it is, I'm doing it again. Right? That would be, we need to add the without judgment part. <laughs> so, present moment awareness. Ah, uh, I'm criticizing myself again. Ah, yeah, there it is. That's suffering. And then the second part, always the easy part. Everybody suffers. I'm human just like everybody else. That's easy. And then the third part, may I be kind to myself? And so, um, this part is not really a positive affirmation. A positive affirmation would be something like, I am kind to myself, or I am awesome, or I am rich, or strong, or whatever. Uh, this is actually an invitation. It opens the door of possibility that you can change your relationship with yourself. That you can change it from that critical relationship to a compassionate relationship. And so I love using the phrase, may I be kind to myself. May I be compassionate to myself. May I be safe and secure. May I be held. May I be loved. May I be needed. All of these things can count as your compassionate phrase for that last part. And so you can totally customize it for yourself. So, I love this photo because I think it kind of embodies what we want to feel when we're practicing inner compassion. Because you can just see the compassion, you know, of this mother for this kid and this kid for the mom. And so it's that body feeling that we want to get ourselves to. And you can do it with your mantra. So I want you to go out this week and I want you to practice your mantra. So you can cut it out stick it in your wallet, carry it around, and I would definitely love to see you back here uh, for the next class. It's gonna be in the library right here, right Jane? And we're gonna do it on Wednesdays from six, four to six, from four to six. Uh, and the schedule is on the front there. We're gonna do one full session on practicing mindfulness, then another one on loving kindness, one specifically on dealing with difficult emotions, and then the final one, uh, oh, I can't remember what it says. It's like, it doesn't say dealing with difficult relationships. It's like, it's more PC than that, right? Transforming, <laughs> transforming relationships, yes, yes. Assuming you have to transform it from somewhere to somewhere else. <laughs> but I would definitely love to see you, and I really appreciate this opportunity. And, um, Please check out more of what I do. I do this uh, both as classes, but I also do individual coaching with clients. And I'm also working on technology-based uh, mobile applications to be able to help people practice this on a regular, regular basis. So thank you very much.